Anyway, let, let's, let's get started. Uh, so before I introduce today's speakers, a couple of housekeeping items. If you need CME credit, text the CME code 56774 to the number that will soon be posted in the chat box. If you have any questions, you can post them in the chat box and I'll read them aloud during the Q&A session. We have two of our Hemong fellows speaking today. They will each speak for about 25 minutes or so and we'll have five minutes of question after each of the presentations. So let me introduce both of them for, first and then Sarah will get started. So, so the first speaker will be Sarah Fenton. Uh, Sarah Elizabeth Fenton completed her MD PhD training at Loyola University in Chicago. She worked with Mitch Denick there, working on keratinocyte biology and looking at the role of cell junctions in cellular transformation metastasis. She then joined the PSTP program, the Physician Scientist Training Program in the Department of Medicine, completed her residency the first two years and the first year of her, her clinical training in HEMOC, and now she's working in the lab of Leon Platanius, working primarily with Diana Solero on melanoma. She's currently a PGY4 fellow, and today she will tell us about her work that she's been doing in the area of melanoma. The, the speaker that's gonna follow Sarah after is Michael Burns, Michael Charles Burns, also completed his uh, PMD PhD training, this time at Vanderbilt University. He worked with Steve Fessick there, and his research was focused on developing novel therapeutics for cancer. He also joined the PSTP program here in the Department of Medicine and is currently PGY4, working in the lab of Dr. Sarki Abdul Kadir. Uh, Dr. Burns is interested in developing novel therapies for aggressive forms of prostate cancer, and he's gonna tell us about his work in this area. So let's, so once again, if you have any questions, please uh, post them in the chat box and I'll read them during the Q&A session. And Dr. Fenton will speak for the next uh, 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll have five minutes of question and answer session. So all yours, uh, Sarah. Thanks, Dr. Munchi. Let me share my screen. Huh. Okay. There we go. Thank you so much, everybody, for taking the time today to be at the Fellows Grand Round, the second Fellows Grand Rounds. As Dr. Munchi mentioned, my name is Sarah Fenton, and today I'm going to be discussing the work I've been doing in the Platanius Lab, looking at ways to enhance the eff efficacy of immune checkpoint inhibitors in melanoma by targeting the interferon gamma pathway. I have no disclosures to report. Um, I thought to Today, we could start with a little bit of background on melanoma. Unfortunately, it remains a common diagnosis with over 100,000 cases diagnosed in the U.S. every year, and these numbers are only increasing. About 30% of these patients are diagnosed at or progress to stage 4 disease, requiring systemic therapies like those that we're going to discuss today. Although we've made major advances over the last several years in the clinic in the treatment of melanoma, the survival expectations for these patients remains poor with a five-year overall survival of about 20%. So obviously there's still a lot of room for improvement in what we have to offer our patients. To that end, I mentioned already the advances that have been made specifically in targeted therapies, which I won't be discussing today, and, immune, and in immune checkpoint inhibitor therapies, or ICIs. In melanoma, there are predominantly two classes of these drugs that are used commonly, antibodies against PD-1 and CTLA-4, proteins that are expressed on the surface of immune cells <clears throat> to prevent the recognition of uh, cells as abnormal. So the immune checkpoint inhibitor therapies, I think, as we're all becoming more familiar with, really operate by blocking this mechanism and restoring the ability of the immune system to recognize um, and hopefully attack and kill the tumor cells. Although we have, as I've mentioned a couple of times, really improved our therapies available uh, to patients, resistance remains a major clinical barrier. About half of patients when they're initially treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors don't respond and therefore have primary resistance to these therapies and about 40% of patients who do initially respond ultimately develop secondary resistance and relapse. So because this remains such a major barrier um, for clinicians and patients, this has become a major topic of study both in the clinic and at the research bench. And this is a figure from a review paper by Jenkins et al. that I think nicely puts together some of these resistance mechanisms that have been identified. These include things like poor antigen presentation by the tumor cell, poor invasion by the immune cells into the tumor microenvironment, and importantly for this talk, uh, impairment of interferon gamma signaling. Interferons are a critical component of antiviral and other uh, immune responses. 
there are three types of interferons, but today we're going to be really focusing on type 2 interferons or interferon gamma. Interferon gamma is made by T cells, B cells, NK and NKT cells, and antigen presenting cells to signal to really all nucleated cells and plays a critical role in the antiviral response as well as immunomodulation and the anti-tumor response. What role specifically does interferon gamma play in the tumor microenvironment? It's really critical in that initial upregulation of the inflammatory response where NK and NKT cells release interferon gamma into the microenvironment, activating macrophages to express MHC2 on their surface, promoting the development of CD8 positive and CD4 positive T cells, also upregulating expression of MHC1 uh, on the surface of tumor cells and a couple of other changes, all of which together create this pro-inflammatory pro tumor microenvironment with increased antigen expression, ultimately resulting in immune cell recognition of tumor cells and tumor cell death. However, a lot of work has been done that has identified mutations in the interferon gamma signaling as uh, pathway as being important in resistance to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. This is one of those papers that I think nicely presents this data by Shin et al. Um, they took about 24 patients, 23 patients, um, that either were responding or were not responding to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy and sequenced those patients' tumors to try to identify mechanisms that were playing a role in resistance. And in this study, um, excuse me, about 14 of those patients were responding. Those are the uh, bars denoted in green, and the remainders were non-responders to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. The bars are representing the mutational burden in each patient's tumor. It's commonly accepted that the higher the mutational burden in the tumor, the more neoantigens are made, and theoretically, the better the immune system should be at recognizing that tumor cells being abnormal. But this patient specifically, with that I've shown with the red arrow or pointed out with the red arrow has a high mutational burden, but was resistant to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And when they sequenced that patient, they found that he or she had a mutation in JAK1, which is a critical component of the interferon gamma signaling pathway that I'm showing here on the left. So interferon gamma binds to its receptor and signals through JAK1 and JAK2 to activate STAT1, which ultimately um, continues to signal through a couple of mechanisms to change gene expression. What the uh, authors of this paper are proposing is that this mutation in JAK1 prevented that signaling pathway from being activated, therefore preventing immune activation in the tumor. And they showed this in a couple of ways, one of which was by measuring CD8 density in the tumor microenvironment and found this patient had poor uh, CD8 density and also measuring PDL1 expression on the surface of the tumor cell. And again, this patient did not upregulate PDL1 on the surface of their uh, tumor cells. So if you put this together, the uh, conclusion that Shin et al. are coming to is that this mutation in JAK1 is driving this primary resistance to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And this has been shown in several papers, um, both associated with primary and secondary resistance to immune checkpoint inhibitors. But the other side of the coin is being shown in the remainder of this figure that I presented the top part of two slides ago. So interferon gamma is critical in that initial elimination phase where the immune system is being activated, recognizing tumor cells, and killing those tumor cells. But as interferon gamma signaling proceeds and becomes chronic, it actually activates a negative feedback mechanism that ultimately uh, upregulates expression of immunosuppressive genes like PDL1, um, decreases antigen expression, and creates an immunologically silent or an exhausted tumor microenvironment where immune cells aren't being recruited, they aren't being activated, and tumor cells are not being killed by the immune system, ultimately allowing that tumor to grow, survive, and escape from the immune system. Interferon gamma signaling through very similar mechanisms has also been associated with immune checkpoint inhibitor resistance. So this chronic interferon gamma signaling uh, down is, uh, signals to downregulate antigen expression, upregulates the expression of immunosuppressive genes, and then through immune intrinsic mechanisms also mediates resistance. 
So this is the kind of the critical component of our hypothesis and of this project is that interferon gamma signaling, while it's really necessary for that initial pro-inflammatory response, ultimately also mediates uh, signaling through pathways that cause, or I'm sorry, I misspoke, through that immunostimulatory um, response, it also mediates immunosuppression. So this led us to ask ourselves whether there was a potential target within that immunosuppressive pathway that would block this negative feedback mechanism, allowing ongoing interferon gamma signaling and an ongoing immune response. To that end, we started to look at ULK1 or UNC51 like kinase 1. ULK1 is a serine threonine kinase involved in autophagy um, primarily, but a novel role for this protein was found in regulation of interferon gamma mediated responses. And this is done through work in the Platanius lab. So in the next couple of experiments I'm showing, um, ULK1 activity was found to be required for expression of interferon gamma targeted genes. Um, here I'm showing a luciferase reporter assay where uh, a plasmid with the luciferase reporter gene and a gamma interferon activation site inserted just before that gene were introduced to cells that either expressed ULK1 and 2 or had knocked down ULK1 and 2. And as you can see here, when ULK1 and 2 was not being expressed, luciferase uh, expression was also reduced. So together, this, or this data suggests ULK1 plays an important role in interferon gamma-mediated gene expression. In this next experiment, wild-type cells and ULK1 and 2 double knockout mouse embryonic fibroblasts were treated with interferon gamma and then RNA was isolated for RNA-seq analysis to try to see which genes are differentially expressed in each treatment group. And about 70 genes were differentially expressed in the cells that maintained expression of ULK1 and 2, the wild-type cells, and these genes were primarily associated with the antiviral response. So in further experiments, mouse embryonic fibroblasts and human fibrosarcoma cells were exposed to the encephalomyocarditis virus, and cell survival was measured. And you can see here that the cells that the wild type cells survived much better when exposed to the virus than the cells without expression of ULK1 and 2. Ultimately, uh, suggesting that ULK1 and 2 is acting downstream of interferon gamma in the antiviral response and is necessary for adequate signaling to protect cells from viral damage. But more critical to this project that I'm presenting today is what was going on in the cells that had lost expression of ULK1 and 2 what was happening with these 108 genes that were differentially expressed in this group. And these genes were primarily associated with things like um, lymphocyte proliferation, T cell activation, cytokine production, um, really the things that are critical for that initial immune or that immune response. And the 268 genes that were differentially expressed in both cell lines were associated with the innate immune response, antigen presentation, Ultimately, if you put this together, suggesting that deletion of ULK1 does not affect these functions, um, the innate immune response and antigen pre presentation, but does relieve suppression of, I'm sorry, let me say this more clearly. ULK1 inhibition relieves suppression of genes involved in immune cell activation, while not really affecting those genes necessary for the induction of immune responses. So we thought this was potentially a very promising target. In another study, we looked at um, publicly available data sets and found that high levels of ULK1 is associated with poor overall survival in melanoma patients. And I'm gonna take a second here to address ULK2 because the data I've shown so far, we were knocking down both ULK1 and 2. Um, ULK2 is a protein that can replace ULK1's function. But as we've moved forward in our studies, we've found that ULK2 expression is almost undetectable, extremely, extremely low in the melanoma cell lines we've been using. And in this figure, we found that ULK2 expression really didn't alter survival expectations in melanoma patients. So moving forward, we've really focused specifically on ULK1. Ultimately asking ourselves whether this could be that potential target we were looking for. Could this block interferon gamma mediated expression of genes associated with immunosuppression and immune checkpoint inhibitor resistance? So this figure puts together our hypothesis. Um, initially, when uh, 
patients are treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors, the T cells are stimulated by interferon gamma release to be activated, recognize the tumor cells as abnormal and kill the tumor cells. But as interferon gamma signaling becomes chronic, it activates a negative feedback mechanism, ultimately causing the upregulation of immunosuppressive genes and immune checkpoints on the tumor cell surface, allowing or preventing that immune mediated tumor cell killing. Our hypothesis is that by inhibiting ULK1, we will be preventing that negative feedback mechanism, restoring the ability of the T cell to recognize and kill the tumor cells, thereby either reversing or preventing resistance to immune checkpoint inhibitors. To that end, I'm gonna be showing a couple of slides with data where we used cell lines that I thought it might be helpful to summarize. So first, the SKML2 cells that we're gonna be used are a human cell line derived from a metastatic uh, site on a male thigh. These cells have mutations in NRAS and wild type BRAF. And the second cell line is a mouse cell line, the Yummer 1.7 cells. These were derived originally as the Yum 1.7 cell line from a mouse with a spontaneous melanoma. They have mutations in BRAF as well as CDKN2A and P10, so very similar to what we see in patients. Um, but this YUM 1.7 cell line was not found to be immunogenic, so it was irradiated to create that high somatic mutational burden that's so characteristic of melanoma, and the YUMR 1.7 cell line is immunogenic. So in this experiment I'm showing here, we took the SKML2 cells in A and knocked down ULK1 with siRNA and then treated the cells with interferon gamma. And you can see here that loss of ULK1 prevented interferon gamma mediated upregulation of the immunosuppressive genes PDL1 and PDL2. In a similar experiment, but instead of using real-time qPCR like in A, using a Western blot, we showed that in Yummer 1.7 cells, knockdown of ULK1 and then exposure of interferon gamma, exposure to interferon gamma prevented upregulation of another immunosuppressive gene, IDO1. In C and D, we're showing very similar results, this time using SKML2 cells where we've completely knocked out ULK1 using the CRISPR Cas9 system. And again, see the exposure to interferon gamma upregulates expression of immunosuppressive genes, but when ULK1 is lost, this upregulation is prevented or blunted. Here though, we wanted to look at what was happening with those immunostimulatory genes. So here we're switching to using a pharmacologic inhibitor of ULK1, SBI 0206965. Moving forward, I'll refer to it as SBI. We took SKML2 cells and exposed to them to SBI in the presence or absence of interferon gamma. And again, on the left, you can see that upregulation of immunosuppressive genes is reduced when ULK1 is inhibited, but upregulation of immunostimulatory genes uh, by interferon gamma exposure really isn't affected by inhibition of ULK1. So ultimately, this suggested to us that when we inhibit ULK1, we can block interferon gamma-mediated upregulation of immunosuppressive, but not immunostimulatory genes. We also asked ourselves, what are we doing to the T cells? Checkpoint inhibitor therapy really relies on the interaction of many cell types to be effective. So we took uh, donor T cells from peripheral blood and we stimulated them overnight and then exposed them to SBI in the presence or absence of interferon gamma. And as you can see here, after 24 hours of exposure, we measured uh, levels of PD-1 and CTLA-4 on the surface of the T cells using flow cytometry and found that really levels of these proteins were not affected, suggesting ultimately to us that um, ULK1 inhibition could potentially work synergistically with immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Uh, in the potentially in the clinic. So this slide again kind of summarizes our hypothesis and where we're going with this with this project. We're proposing that by inhibiting ULK1, we can prevent that negative feedback mechanism mediated by interferon gamma, allowing ongoing uh, immune recognition of the tumor cells and immune mediated cell killing, potentially redu reducing, preventing, or reversing resistance to ICI therapy. 
we're doing more work to define this pathway in our melanoma cells um, and understand the signaling that is being activated. And then the, really the next step is gonna be to take this in vivo in mouse models and see if we're able to alter the efficacy of ICI therapy in these mice. Um, obviously this research was not done in a vacuum. I think particularly as a clinician scientist, it really takes an amazing team to put together this data. And I have been so fortunate in working with the Platanius lab. Dr. Platanius himself has been a really excellent mentor in experimental design and in grant writing um, particularly. And I can't say enough about how great he has been and how supportive. And another person I really specifically wanted to call out is Dr. Deanna Solero. She is my mentor in the lab and really what a fantastic investigator. Um, she has been such an influence in, for me in um, really thinking critically about the experiments that we're proposing and in writing. She's a really fantastic investigator. And the rest of the Platanius lab, I can't say enough about how much support they've given me and I really have found such an excellent group of people to work with. I also wanted to thank our collaborators, the Lapool Lab, the Rebus Lab, and the Richmond Lab. And I wanted to thank my clinical mentors, Dr. Sassman and Chandra, who gave me those initial opportunities in the clinic and with some review paper opportunities and things to really spark my interest in immune checkpoint inhibitor therapies and melanoma therapy. I also wanted to thank the Oncology Fellowship, uh, Drs. Pro Stein and Dr. Mun Munchi, who has recently become kind of our PSTP mentor, have been so incredibly helpful in this transition back to basic science from my clinical training that I've been doing for several years. I also wanted to thank the HEMOC department and the PSTP program for giving us so many resources, um, because really I think this career is so resource intensive. So with that, I wanted to take a break for questions and just thank everybody who has been a part of helping me get this research project started. I think uh, I don't see uh, any questions in the chat box. Well, well here's one. Uh, here's a question that says, do you have plans to look at the effect of interferon gamma on the PDL1, PDL2, PDL or in other tumor infiltrated immune cells? such as macrophages and MDSCs? Yes, definitely. Um, doing that in vitro has been a little bit difficult, but definitely once we start our in vivo systems, we'll be able to look at kind of globally what we're doing to the immune system. And I think that's gonna be really interesting. So there's another, another question. Any plans to combine with PD-1 in the future? PD-1 inhibitors in the future? Yeah, so that's that's our our goal in the mouse model is to combine our, I don't think ULK1 inhibition is gonna be sufficient as a monotherapy for sure. So combining it with the uh, PD-1 inhibitors, I think is where we're gonna see its efficacy and we're really excited to see whether in our mouse models we're able to improve outcomes. Are there transgenic mice for ULK1? Uh, no? Not yet. Maybe in the future. And what is known about the toxicity of ULK1 when you target it? Uh, from any, from, uh, these are drugs that are, they must have done some uh, studies yeah. early on. Yeah, so um, there, there is a ULK1 inhibitor that's being introduced into very early clinical trials um, in humans, but we know we've done some studies in mice and found that it's it's very tolerable. There's very little toxicity. So here's another question in the chat box. Do you think the proposed ULK1 mechanism is unique to melanoma or can be more universal to other tumor types also? My hope is that it's universal to multiple tumor types. Um, you know, this underlying pro-inflammatory mechanism and then the feedback through interferon gamma theoretically should be present in, in all tumors that are responding to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. So I hope that it's applicable to um, systems or histologies other than melanoma, but that I think is a good place to start since we have so, so much deeper of an understanding of um, how ICIs work in this tumor type. OK, 
Okay, so another question. Are we aware of any ULK1 mutation that can affect its function? Mutations in ULK1. That can affect its function, either seen in patients or in any, any tumor types of any sort. So not off the top of my head, I don't think that that has been looked into at all, but we are starting to do those um, investigations into different publicly available data sets. In fact, the next presenter, Dr. Burns, is helping me with that. All right, and then a question, another question from the, does ULK1 affect Treg? So essentially, does it affect the other immune cells? Not that we are aware of yet. I think the role of ULK1 in the system is really novel. Um, and hasn't really been investigated yet. So not that we're aware of. I think I don't see any more questions in the chat box. Uh, anyone else have any questions they can shout out. Otherwise, uh, we can go to our next speaker. I think I've introduced Dr. Burns and Dr. Burns is gonna tell us about his work in Dr. Sarkis' lab or his planned work in Dr. Sarkis' lab. So thanks Dr. Fenton and, and here you go, Dr. Burns. Great work, Dr. Fenton. I'm gonna continue the theme a little bit, talking about monotherapies and combination therapies, but uh, certainly a, a, a different topic. So today I'm gonna talk to you about the uh, genomic landscape of prostate cancer specifically. Um, look at what's been done within the field and the therapeutic opportunities that exist um, moving forward. So today's objectives include to understand the genomic alterations that drive prostate cancer. And then we'll look at prostate cancer in different clinical subgroups um, and how the alterations that drive those subgroups can vary. We'll use age as a specific example today. And then I'll take a broader kind of a step back to look at the drivers of prostate cancer, um, what's been targeted, uh, so clinically available and what has not and how those represent opportunities. Um, specifically, what I'm doing in Sarkey's lab, looking at um, developing new inhibitors of MYC. So, so prostate cancer is uh, often viewed as a indolent disease, but in fact, it's a more heterogeneous one. Uh, if you consider it, it has many slow growing phenotypes. However, there's also patients that have aggressive and more lethal phenotypes. To the right, you can see data from the SEER database um, that just shows that prostate cancer is the leading diagnosis for cancer among men in 2020. Now, the majority of these patients will have uh, local regional disease and undergo either radiation therapy or um, surgery. And the five-year overall survival rate for those patients is excellent, uh, approaching 100%. However, it's a highly prevalent disease. And so if you look to the bottom graph, what you can see is that it's still the second leading cause of cancer-related mortality among men in the United States. And so it has very aggressive phenotypes as well. And that's the majority of what we see in our clinics uh, in medical oncology. So patients with metastatic disease, patients that need systemic therapies. I want to introduce the concept of early onset prostate cancer. Um, it's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, to the right, again, is SEER database data. Uh, this is from a review in 2014. But what it looks at, uh, top right panel, is just the incidence of prostate cancer broken down by age. If you look at the green graph and the orange graph, what you can see is that patients that are young have a very low incidence of prostate cancer. But if you look at the bottom two panels, whether or not you are recommended for PSA screening, that incidence is still on the rise. So it's an important clinical population to understand. And it's a clinical population that may be unique in terms of the genetic alterations that drive this cancer. Um, so when we look at this, we also look for ways that we can improve our long-term management of these patients, whether that be early systemic interventions or um, a growing field is how we're sequencing the therapies that we do have available to us in the clinic, as well as looking for new ones moving forward. Today, I'm gonna to be talking to you about uh, comprehensive genomic profiling. Um, Maybe a concept familiar to many of you from last week from the presentation at Grand Rounds, or if you're familiar with uh, next generation sequencing from the clinic, all of the data from today will be from Foundation Medicine 
Um, this was done with members of Sarkey's lab, including Zach Chalmers, who's on the call. Um, testing is actually, this is real world data. So it's testing that was ordered by physicians in the clinic as part of routine clinical care. Uh, archive tissue was allowed. We'll kind of go into that in a minute. And then basically all of the clinical data that we have from this um, study is from the reports and requisition forms that were sent with the samples. Uh, we filtered it so there's one sample per patient. If you look at this data set, what you can see is that we have 6,000 unique samples. These were sent between November 2012 and December 2018 with specimens dating back as far as 1998. Now, what that means is that if you had a patient in the clinic and you wanted to be able to send their, um, their tumor for NGS sequencing, um, but didn't want to expose them to a new biopsy, you could have sent whatever tissue you had available to yourself. Um, in terms of demographics, you can see the age here. We had a median age in this group of 66 with a range between 34 and 90. The majority of our patients were from European ancestry, although there's a significant portion of African ancestry as well as others. Um, today we're going to be talking about age, so I'll start out just by looking at the different groups that we have. We have about 300 patients that were aged less than 50 um, at time of tissue being sent for NGS testing, over a thousand that are between age 50 and 60, and then uh, the majority of our patients have kind of typical onset prostate cancer um, happening at age greater than 60. This is just looking at patient age um, for each sample that we have. About half the samples that we have were from um, prostate tumor biopsies um, versus the other half being from distant metata or metastasis sites. Um, the right is just a simple histogram looking at patient age versus the number of samples that we have for each one. Um, it's colored by whether or not it was from a prostate tumor biopsy versus a metastatic site. And then the dotted lines are just our age groups. So age less than 50, age 50 to 60, and age greater than 60. In terms of tissue distribution, again, half of the lesions were from the prostate. And then in terms of uh, metastatic sites, there was a pretty broad just distribution with where you could expect for prostate cancer samples. So lymph nodes were the most common, followed by liver and bone. Um, although there was a pretty good distribution with lung biopsies, uh, as well as even CNS biopsies in some cases. This is looking at it broken down by um, both variables. So first being age, and then by site of biopsy. Um, the top pie chart is age less than 50. And what you can see for early onset disease, patients were more likely to have their um, prostate tumor sent for NGS testing. Now, there could be multiple reasons for that. I'm not gonna go into everything here for why patients may have had you know, a one metastatic site versus a primary prostate site sent, but I just wanna point this out at the onset um, as something that we'll try to control for going forward um, in each of the analysis and kind of, uh, we can discuss the, the finer points of why uh, elderly patients would have metastatic sites sent versus um, young patients as well. If we look at the most common genomic alterations, what you can see is kind of things that are frequently mutated within cancer. So tumor suppressors, the PI3 kinase pathway uh, is significantly altered in prostate cancer more so than other cancer types. Androgen receptor axis, this is a, a disease that is driven by male hormones. And so it's not surprising to find amplifications within the androgen receptor and other genes related to the pathway. DNA damage response, um, epigenetic modifiers with your mixed lineage leukemia genes, and then common oncogenes. I'll point out a few here, uh, actually maybe one specifically, because we're gonna talk about it later, MYC being altered in about 11% of uh, prostate cancers that's, that's most frequently by amplification. This, this data doesn't take into account expression data. So RNA transcripts and protein levels not included here. This is just a graph looking at age-related variation for each gene that's mutated within prostate cancer. So on the x-axis, you'll have gene, and then on the y-axis, age. 
And then I've separated it into whether it's a biopsy from prostate versus a metastatic site. Um, some, some kind of obvious things that, you'll, that you'll, your eyes will be drawn to is that there's more in the lower panel than the top panel. And that's not surprising that we're finding more mutations in metastatic disease than we are in primary uh, prostate tumor sites. All this data is broken down by alteration type. So in red is copy number alteration for things like your androgen receptor and MYC. Um, P10 loss is included here. And then in green, you'll see a single nucleotide variant, so mutations and things like PI3 kinase. And then uh, blues, your, your fusions, Tympris 2 erg being the most common in prostate cancer. There are some BRAF fusions. They don't make it onto this table or this graph, this is things that are altered in over 2% of all prostate cancers. And then in addition to looking at age by, uh, uh, as a continuous variable, we can then group it into the three subgroups that I discussed earlier. So this is looking at age greater than 60 on the X axis versus age less than 50 on the Y axis. Now anything that's altered equally between the two groups should fall along the 45 degree line, okay? Statistically significant genes that are altered more frequently in elderly patients include the androgen receptor and SPOP. SPOP, for those of you not familiar with it, is a tumor suppressor gene that um, one altered will actually have, uh, cancers will have an increased transcription of the androgen receptor. And then although not significant at a, at a gene level, Tympris 2 stands out as one that's more frequently altered in age less than 50. So this graph specifically looks at individual genes altered within each cohort, okay? In addition to look at individual genes, we can group the genes by clinically relevant pathways. And this is 11 different pathways that these genes have been grouped into. Um, we can start at the top, ones that, you know, showed up on the first graph as well. So the PI3 kinase, AKT, mTOR pathway, this also includes P10 loss, P53 being commonly altered in prostate cancer. And then a couple that I'll point out to you for those interested in um, DNA damage uh, repair, either, either BRCA1-2, um, which is kind of your profound arm A, or all of the genes grouped in DNA damage profound arm A and B. Um, we can look at Wnt pathway, MAP kinase pathway, which is frequently altered in other cancer types. Think of pancreatic, lung, colon, uh, but not so commonly in uh, prostate cancer. And then the things that are statistically different by cohort. So it's a kind of a complicated graph, but I'll walk you through it. On ages on the, ages colored in um, purple, blue, and pink, uh, the elderly group is, is the purple pentagons, and what you'll see is purple's most commonly on the right, okay? So that means that we're finding more mutations in all of these pathways with age, which is not surprising given that cancer is often a disease of age. Uh, the notable exception to this would be Tempris 2. Um, the trend is purple, blue, pink, uh, so being commonly found in um, age less than 50 as well as elderly patients. And then we can also look at, at the difference in the alteration frequency. So the androgen receptor, for instance, shown here being more frequently altered in age greater than 60 compared to the younger age groups. I think Dr. Fenton just talked about um, some immunotherapies. I know there were questions about uh, PDL1. Um, here we looked at tumor mutational burden and age. I don't think you need to look at each panel, but if you just look at age, or if you just look at panel A, what you can see is tumor mutational burden, low, intermediate, and high, um, and then age on the y-axis. So what this shows is you have increasing tumor mutational burden with age. I, I caution about jumping to conclusions here. Um, most people think increased mutational burden, uh, immunotherapy would be promising for this, but um, I 
I wouldn't do that in the clinic just yet because immunotherapy has had limited benefits for patients with prostate cancer. That's either alone or in combination, um, in part because there's an immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. And so there's a lot of work right now, both in our lab and across the country, looking at how to change um, cold tumors to hot tumors or ones that the immune system can recognize more readily. So what do we do with a giant data set like this? Um, not only is it useful for identifying specific drivers of uh, cancer in terms of different um, clinical subgroups, but also it provides us with a window to look at therapeutic opportunities what's been done, what has not been done, and what can be done. In red, I've highlighted um, tumor suppressors, TP53, APC, and RB1. These are kind of your classic uh, tumor suppressors in cancer. I don't have a way in the clinic to reactivate TP53 yet. I think that would be a dream for multiple tumor types, but we're just not there yet. Um, in orange, I think the androgen receptor Axis is going to be a cornerstone for patients with prostate cancer and part of their therapy moving forward, <clears throat> regardless of any other therapies that we add in combination on top of it. Um, it's just that critical to how this, uh, the biology of this disease. The PI3 kinase pathway, I think, is very promising, it, or altered in 40 to 60 percent of prostate cancers. The PI3 kinase inhibitors specifically. I haven't had the exact efficacy or tolerability that we'd hoped for, but I think this pathway in prostate cancer, we'll see a lot more of it moving forward, especially with things like the AKT inhibitors that are starting to make their way through the clinic. <clears throat> There's a lot of work done on the bars in green. So looking at um, therapies uh, that are more effective in patients that have alterations in DNA damage repair. So whether that be platinum agents or PARP inhibitors. Um, and then epigenetic modifiers are starting to make their way through. And then in purple are things that I'm specifically interested in. So MYC, beta-catenin, cyclin D1. I would also add RAS to the list, although not frequently mutated in cancer or in prostate cancer. Um, these are things that we know that they're highly validated uh, targets for cancer. It's just we've had a very difficult time developing therapies that are available to us in the clinic. So I think that is a promising field um, to target moving forward. And so for those of you who know me um, or those of you who don't know me, my interest lies specifically in the development of novel therapeutics for cancer, um, not just novel therapies as your next me2 kinase inhibitor, but using um, chemical biology more broadly as an approach to develop probes that can then test um, new biological questions and also help validate new approaches, new mechanisms for inhibiting cancers moving forward. So when I came to Northwestern, um, and started working with uh, Dr. Hussein. She pointed me towards Dr. Abdulkader's lab, who was focusing on targeting MYC in prostate cancer. So MYC is a master transcription factor, um, often amplified and overexpressed, not just in prostate cancer, but in, in a lot of tumor types. And it's responsible for tumor, for maintenance, tumor formation, maintenance, and therapeutic resistance. Um, it's really been difficult to target with small molecules because it lacks a well-defined small molecule binding site. Um, and so despite being known for over three decades, uh, we still don't have any effective MYC targeted therapy in the clinic. Um, below, I just show a signaling path, but you don't have to memorize the whole thing right now. Um, but it, it's just highlighting the concept that um, one new approach to targeting MYC uh, can be to uh, target its degradation um, or its protein stability, and that there are multiple pathways, including the MAP kinase pathway and PI3 kinase pathway that, that feed into regulating its stability. And so part of the project that I have moving forward is how we can intervene on this pathway to degrade MYC uh, as a new therapeutic option for patients with prostate cancer. So when I joined the lab, um, 
Sharkey was already working on this project in which he was screening small molecules uh, as MYC inhibitors. So what he wanted was something that not only worked against just an individual protein, but something that was active in vivo. And so he coupled a small molecule screen um, with, act, er, with um, rapid in vivo testing to identify these two molecules on the left side uh, that show MYC inhibitors that are capable of binding directly to MYC, inhibiting the MYC-MAX interaction, preventing MYC transcription, and shrinking tumors in vivo, both as uh, monotherapy and a combination therapy with anti-PD-1 therapies. And so when I joined the lab, there were two pressing questions. One is how exactly are these working? And two, how can we optimize them as we try to translate them more to the clinic uh, to accomplish the goal that we haven't been able to accomplish for over 30 years? And so one of the things that's critical about these molecules that he identified is that they phosphorylate MYC and result in degradation. So that's kind of what I'm going to focus in on or zero in on in the next couple of slides. So MYC I975 is the compound that was identified um, and is currently published. It is shown here as the structure. And what you can see in the top right panel, it's a Western blot, which is hard to look at by Zoom, but I'll walk you through it. Treatment of cells with MYC I975 leads to an increase in MYC phosphorylation on 3 mean 58. Okay, so that's, if you look at the zero time point at T58, it's a light band and it gets darker with time. Um, no change in serine 62. And then in the middle panel, what you have is just a Western blot for for MYC protein levels. And what you can see is after three hours here, MYC, de MYC gets degraded following compound treatment. If we mutate that threonine site that gets phosphorylated to an alanine, what happens is that MYC no longer gets degraded, okay? So the bottom part is just a summary, a little schematic, um, of what's going on here. So MYC I975 is an inhibitor that binds directly to MYC, causing phosphorylation of threonine 58 and leading to degradation. That's the basic premise of my basic science work. So the goal here is to optimize these MYC, MYC degraders um, as a possible new therapy for prostate cancer. Aims, specific aims here are to understand the signaling pathways responsible for this degradation process. So again, same diagram. The question is, how does this phosphorylation event at 3 and 58 come about? We know the molecules bind directly to MYC, but how is something that binds on the other side regulating this phosphorylation process? Okay, and there are a couple of different upstream pathways that I showed earlier on. Uh, the MAP kinase and PI3 kinase pathway that play in, that have been shown to regulate um, mixed ability. And those are where I'm going to start evaluating. Um, I'll do this in vitro and in vivo. And then in addition to looking at these compounds on their own, I'm also going to be looking at them um, using an engineered heterobifunctional approach. So for those of you that are familiar with the term PROTAC, um, so a proteasome targeting chimera. It's basically a molecule that has two different functional ends tethered by a linker region. In this case, um, a, an end that binds to your target protein being MYC, and the other end's a, a, an E3 ligase ligand. So it artificially targets any protein of interest to the proteasome, um, engineering a degradation approach. So basically, two different degrader approaches. One looking at mechanisms that regulate native signaling pathways to lead to MYC degradation, and two, an engineered approach um, to target MYC directly to the proteasome. The plan is to use small molecules that regulate phosphorylation both at serine 62 and threonine 58. Um, what we know about MYC is that these two sites are critical for MYC protein stability. Um, MYC gets phosphorylated by the MAP kinase pathway on serine 62, and then subsequently phosphorylated by GSK3 beta on 3 and 58 downstream of the PI3 kinase pathway. Um, this leads to a dephosphorylation event, um, leaving MYC marked with just a 3 and 58 phosphorylation. 
um, which targets it for degradation. So whether or not this MIC ion endotoxin 5 is being re regulated by these two pathways or a new undescribed pathway is something that we're looking at right now in the clinic or in the lab. And then I'm also working with the Center for Molecular Innovation and Drug Discovery um, to design better um, degraders of MIC, both from you know, just optimizing MIC-975 versus making protax. And what's been shown in the paper that I showed that Sarki published uh, late last year is that MIC-975 can be tethered on this ether position marked in blue and um, attached to a biotin molecule as a probe um, to study um, interactions with MIC-975 in cells. But we can also use this as a handle to attach a linker to an E3 ligase ligand. Uh, different ligands can help direct this to the proteasome, um, hopefully optimizing this degradation phenotype. And the goal is what you see in the bottom. Um, it's to develop a new inhibitor. Um, and this is just an analog of MIC I975 that when you treat cells with will degrade MIC. And so here you can see with the triangle, increasing concentrations of um, a MIC inhibitor lead to decreased uh, levels of MIC protein expression within cells. So I'm looking at two different approaches to try to degrade these and optimize them as a potential new therapy for prostate cancer. So overall, I have a couple of different projects that I talked to you about today. The first being a translational project looking at genomic alterations within prostate cancer and how different clinical subgroups can have um, different alterations. TIMPRESS2 may be more relevant in patients with early onset disease uh, versus AR alterations and increased tumor mutational burden in the elderly. Um, how we can optimize our management of patients going forward. I think different sim clinical subgroups in, in terms of driving drivers of disease will vary, but also how we manage those patients because you know, managing an 85-year-old with prostate cancer versus a 50-year-old with prostate cancer, you're, you're more likely to see that, that younger patient for many, many years. And so we're going to have to think of not only what we use, but how we use it and when. And then finally, kind of looking at the quote-unquote undruggable targets and how we can use the strengths of academia, both in terms of um, synthesizing new probes to uh, understand new concepts in biology and kind of pave the way for new approaches to targeting these um, oncogenes moving forward is something that I'm working on in the lab, specifically um, looking at MIC. Uh, I'd like to thank a number of people, including the fellowship, the PSTP program. A lot of this work was done by people within Sarkey's lab. Zach is responsible for most of the foundation medicine work um, that I showed early on, and Huying has uh, been the primary driver between, behind the MIC project. And then certainly I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Hussein for all of her help, not only looking at this project with the um, age-related variation in genomic drivers, but also clinical mentorship as well as um, research uh, in everything I do, making it more relevant, as well as everyone that kind of reviews my work and uh, puts it through the fire to make it better. But then I'll take questions. Okay. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, post them in the chat box and I can, I can read them aloud. And maybe I can, I can get started by asking a question. Why do you think Tempus 2 is lower in younger men than older folks, even the, especially since the androgen regulated the gene? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, it's interesting. It's not much, much higher, but I think it may represent um, kind of a um, specific molecular subtype of prostate cancer patients, patients that have early onset disease that um, are, are driven, you know, it's another androgen sensitive group, I agree, um, but they can have early onset disease as well as anybody else. So I don't know why. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, a couple of questions from the chat box. Is MIC inhibitor also disrupting self renewal capacity of prostate cancer stem cells? I have not looked at uh, stem cells specifically, Frank, um, but certainly a good idea. The next question, are you planning to look into MIC partners such as MAX uh, in your inhibiting approach? Yes, short answer is yes on that. Uh, we do look at uh, MIC, not, MIC not only for its interaction with MAX, but also for what these compounds do to other um, partners that interact with MIC. Um, so you could imagine if you're degrading MIC, are you degrading some of its partners as well? And what do you think is the toxicity of MIC inhibitors globally in you know, transgenic mice when you knock out MIC, what really happened? Because systemically you're giving you this drug to every cell in the body, right? Right. Um, you know, I think there are two different questions. So the question, if you have something that is essential, um, is that a bad target in terms of drug discovery? I don't think so, um, is the short answer. I think. Something that's important for development is different than um, inhibiting that in uh, a patient with cancer. And so I think Stuart Schreiber has a recent paper in Nature looking at essential genes and how they are viewed in terms of drug discovery. Um, but I, I don't think, uh, if it's essential, I don't think it rules it as a drug target. Any other questions, if you have, please post them in the chat box or shout out. And I think I'm sure we can, it's a small enough group that we can, we can hear everyone. Going once, going twice. It looks like there are no additional questions. So thanks again. Oh, one more question. Uh, Dr. Hussein says, great job. And so with that, uh, I think we'll end. Uh, thank you. And I think this is our last, uh, uh, grand rounds for this academic year and we'll resume once again in the fall sometime. So thanks again for coming and thank you for the presentation from both uh, Dr. Fenton and Dr. Burns. All right. Okay, so, perfect.